But may I ask you to um, present the slides or show the slides? Sure, I can do that. Yeah, um, because uh, we are two presenters today, I will um, present the first half of the slides and Justin will take over then for the rest of the sounds, slides. Sounds good. Sounds good. No problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get going then. Um, again, uh, a note well, a reminder that uh, this note well applies here. And um, this is the list of interim meetings. Today we'll be talking about Rar, uh, Thorsten, and uh, Justin will be presenting. Um, next week, hopefully, Daniel will talk to us about security BCP. And notice that I've added also um, a new interim meeting for May 3rd uh, to continue that discussion about OA 2.1. So that's, uh, that's all we have uh, from a scheduled perspective. Any questions, comments about this schedule? Okay, good. So let me then switch gears to the slides. Hey guys. Yeah, nice. Hey, Rifat. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? Or, or the, yes, the slide? work. Okay. Um, mm, you see the interim meeting um, slides. Oh. oh, oh, okay. Hold on just one sec. Then sharing, stop, and then share application. How about now? Awesome. Okay. Let me just one second here. Yeah. If you can put it in the presentation mode, that would be fine. It would be great. Oh. How do you do that from here? Maybe I, I need know. to download it. Hold on. I mean, otherwise I'm going to present. So that's. Hold I on. mean, if you if you just open it in the in the Acrobat reader or whatever reader you have, then typically Control N L will do the job. Yeah, let me save it for mm -hmm. second test. Thank you very much. No worries. Screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just one second here. Let's get going. I'm gonna paste that the link again to so that you you can guys add your name. Whoever has hasn't done that, please add your name to the list. And um, let's get going. Uh, Torsten, it's yours. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, um, hello, everybody. My name is Thorsten Lodderstedt. I'm one of the authors of the rich authorization request drafts. Brian Campbell and Justin Richard, who are also present in the call, are my fellow co-authors. Um, the rich authorization request draft, uh, next slide, please. Um, the rich authorization request uh, draft was adopted as working group draft, I think a, a year ago, I think during the last, the last physical or in presence ITF meeting in Singapore. And uh, what it does, it, it, it introduces a new parameter, authorization details, uh, that allows um, an application to convey uh, fine-grained um, authorization data in the form of JSON objects. Um, what it basically does is it's designed to be used in places where the scope parameter, the simple scope parameter, is not sufficient. Um, the idea uh, came up when um, uh, we had the FAPI working group at the OpenID Foundation analyzed um, a couple of standardization efforts in the open banking space where we saw um, a lot of different uh, patterns um, that were used to convey structured and also transaction specific authorization data, uh, which wasn't possible or is not possible with the scope as it stands today. And based on what we learned there, um, the proposal was uh, made to use um, the JSON structure that we that we now have in the authorization details uh, parameter. So um, there are other use cases as well that inspired the development of, of uh, um, RAR, and those are also sec sectors where uh, RAR already is being adopted. Uh, open banking is already mentioned. Um, CDR in Australia and FTX in the US are taking a look into using RAR. 
um, in e-health in the Nor uh, in, uh, Norwegian uh, e-health sector. They are already using uh, RAR and um, the Cloud Signature Consortium, uh, the standardization body for remote signature creation APRs, also decided to adopt um, rich authorization requests. On the right-hand side, you can see an example. Um, so a rich authorization request um, always has a uh, type field. So the uh, authorization server can determine the type of the authorization object and can then, based on the type, um, yeah, determine how to process um, a certain type. In that case, it's an example of a authorization for a payment initiation. So it tells us what currency and amount um, the merchant wants to, to transfer, the name of the creditor and the target account. But it's just an example. It's, it's a very universal concept that can be used uh, with all kinds of, of, of uh, structured uh, JSON data. Um, the same structure is also used by NAP and uh, we are continuously synchronizing uh, with NAP so, um, to, to uh, keep the specs and, and the syntax in sync between rich authorization requests and, and, and NAP. Next slide, please. So, um, I checked and we presented last time at ITF uh, 107, which is a year, pretty much exactly a year ago. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we produced three new revisions. Um, what we did is we restructured the whole draft for better readability because in the first in the first drafts uh, we are more organized along the uh, the sequence of, of a certain use case. Now it's more structured along the the, the endpoints, uh, authorization endpoint, um, token endpoint, and then the introspection or um, representation of authorization details in our access tokens. And we added a lot of clarifications. So, for example, how uh, resource the resource parameter. Uh, as defined in uh, resource indicators, um, works together with authorization details. And we also explained how authorization detail can be enriched in the course of an authorization process. Uh, so, for example, uh, um, uh, there are use cases where a, um, a client, for example, asks for access to um, account data, for example, bank account data, without specifying um, the, the actual accounts it wants to access. That can be decided by the user and then the authorization details object uh, becomes enriched in the course of the process and is then played back to the client with the with the additional information. And we also did, we also added text around um, error handling for um, unknown authorization details parameters and so on. So as you see, no, no substantial change basically. Uh, the spec in its core is pretty stable. Uh, where we, where we um, incorporated feedback uh, that we got from implementers and, and reviewers. What we also did is uh, we added implementation considerations because it turned out that there were, even though from my perspective, the spec is pretty simple, um, there was always the question of what, what do I need in my product, in my project, in order to support great authorization requests. I, I, will, I will dig into that in more detail in the next, in the next slide. And as I already pointed out, we are continu continuously synchronizing uh, with Jeff, mostly via Justin, who happens to be an author in both in both uh, uh, working groups. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so regarding implementation considerations, so we mostly focused on what what it takes in an authorization server implementation to support rich authorization requests, and. One observation is that um, processing of authorization requests containing authorization details, as well as a presentation of the authorization details to the user, for example, in the user consent, varies significantly among the different authorization data types. So, for example, if you want to access um, um, account data, uh, you might want to ask, um, ask the, the user whether she wants to give the client access to the balance and what accounts, uh, con concrete accounts, uh, she wants to get, give the client access to. Whereas, for example, in, in electronic signing, it's completely different. In the user consent, you typically ask the user whether uh, she agrees to authorize the, si the, the signature over a set of certain uh, named documents. Um, and because this processing is so different, uh, we, 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 might, uh, we, we found it a, a good idea to spell out what we, what we expect products to do in order to support our rich uh, authorization requests. So, first of all, 
products should um, allow deployments to uh, determine the presentation of authorization details. Um, the whatever the product does, I mean, this is at the discretion of the of the of the implementer. Might be just uh, some some user interface tweaking. Might be support for uh, um, really custom custom code. It's up to the implementation. We just we just notice it shall be possible that the presentation of an authorization detail can be determined by deployment. And it shall be possible to, or should be possible to modify authorization details. Um, I already gave, gave one example that the uh, user might, for example, want to, to select um, the, the accounts in, uh, she wants um, the client to get access to, but there are other, other examples as well. And um, it should also be possible to merge requested and pre-existing authorization details. So, for example, let's just assume um, the client already obtained a grant, um, has access to, um, let's say, one, one account, can read a balance, and in the next authorization request, the, um, the, the same client also wants to extend or enhance this, this authorization uh, to be able to access tra that transaction history of the same account. Um, that, that should be possible or might be might be allowed by by an implementation as well, and there are there are a couple of couple of ways that can be implemented. And we had we had some discussions with different implementers how they how they could or how they implement um, raw support, um, and also with implementers that um, not based on raw but um, um, facing uh, similar requirements in the open banking space. Um, how they have implemented this kind of custom logic, and one of them is uh, one way is to, from the AS, um, yeah, allow a redirect, for example, to a custom mod custom module that then presents the the rich authorization request to the user, um, gathers the uh, gathers the, the consent, and then um, yeah, informs the AS about the outcome of that process. It's also possible to have APIs or callbacks in one way or the other. So, for example. Uh, in, one might envision that um, the um, the AES um, allows to to implement callbacks from the core of the AES to some custom model, modules that implement the custom logic for a certain deployment. But it goes also the other way around. So some some uh, some uh, AES projects or products um, don't have a user interface, for example. Uh, uh, instead, the deployment builds a authorization um, um, endpoint. Completely um, on its own, and then calls into the product uh, to get information about what what um, parameters uh, were present in the authorization request, and then can also um, send back the result of the user consent uh, to the product. And there are other options, including also to just create a fork, for example, of an open source project, and and do a custom build. And why did we do this? Uh, we perceived there were uh, some reluctance in the community to, to, to uh, uh, implement raw support, even though it's, it's pretty simple. So if we, for example, um, at Yes.com, we implemented raw on top of an, an existing product without any product support, because basically a rich authorization request or an authorization details is just a custom parameter. That's it. Okay, next slide, please. So, so there is one. Other questions or? No, keep going. Okay, good. So uh, there is one. There is one open topic that we uh, would like to bring to your attention and and, and discuss uh, today in the call. And this is um, yeah the question whether we uh, add a authorization details parameter as a token request parameter. So far, the spec only only um, uh, specifies the authorization details request as an authorization request parameter. But there were questions raised on the list or in discussions. Um, so, for example, in the OAuth security workshop that led us to this discussion. First of all, there was the question: How does a client determine the privileges? Assigned to the first access token when a code is being uh, uh, redeemed. So um, the spec currently is 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 quite or silent on, on on that topic. So you can either assign all the privileges, or you can apply any any AS specific logic. Uh, but the client doesn't have a handle to really control it. All it will get to know is in the token response what authorization uh, details the user in the end uh, uh, consented with. 
There's also the question of whether it will be possible to downscope privileges. So, for example, if a client obtained uh, privileges for uh, a couple of APIs, and then uh, with the first access token uh, uh, wants to get just a very, very narrowly scoped access token, First of all, the authorization details need to be assigned to a refresh token, and later on, with the refresh token grant, um, the client uh, would need to be able to, to tell the AS, please assign uh, uh, this subset of privileges that exist in the pre-existing grant uh, to my access token. And clearly, there's also another use case, which is um, support for the client credentials flow, in, in which case, um, the client just would request um, using the authorization details uh, parameter in the token request. So in all those different um, impulses um, aim in the same, exactly the same direction, which is the authorization details token request parameter. And um, the tricky bit, or what is perceived as the tricky bit, is then in, in this case, we need to compare uh, what we've requested and what's already there. Or as Justin typically tell, uh, states that uh, uh, you want something, you have something, and the question is, what will you get? Next slide, please. And with that, I hand over to Justin to explain uh, his thoughts about uh, comparing authorization details. All right, thanks, Torsten. Um, before I go in, do we have any questions about the, the, uh, the first section, the state of the draft, and things like that before I dive into this topic? I don't see anyone queuing in chat. And if nobody is, can you please go mute if you're not speaking? Because sometimes you get some some noise on the on the line. So um, go ahead, Dave. just okay. All right. So uh, this whole idea of comparing these authorization details objects is uh, is fundamental to a lot of the parts of the protocol. Um, and uh, it shows up in places, uh, you know, there's the obvious places like downscoping that Torsten was just talking about, but then there's also this notion of you need to compare, um, you know, say you've got a client that's allowed to do certain things and then they're asking for more than what that client is allowed to do or the user is trying to approve more than what their role as the resource owner allows them to do. You need to be able to compare these kinds of things with each other. Uh, next slide, please. And we're uh, we're kind of used to doing this in um, with scopes, because what you're supposed to see is that if somebody is asking for A, B, C scopes, then that means that they are by definition of uh, six, seven, four, nine, requesting more than A and B. Their scopes are designed to be additive. But the real world doesn't really work like that, and we all know that because sometimes scope C is included when you ask for scope A. That's just part of the definitions of scope A and C. They're part of the same API and they're related to each other. Or sometimes you get a scope that turns on special uh, special processing at the AS or at the RS. It's not really asking for a different kind of access. It's just it's another flag to send to uh, the AS as part of processing. You don't have to look very far to see real world examples of this. I, I pulled these, uh, you know, we all know OpenID Connects, OpenID Scope turns on uh, things like the ID token and all sorts of uh, other bits of processing. Um, and the and it's only in combination with like open ID and email does the open ID connect email scope uh, even have semantic meaning. Uh, right? So uh, also, right, the GitHub API, if you ask for the repo scope, then that actually includes everything that is inside the repo status scope and more. So there's uh, subsumptive definitions here. So it's not as clean as the original OAuth uh, scope design uh, was intending it to be, uh, these real, real world use cases. But the thing with scopes is that because it is a set of strings, you can still kind of get by by doing a lazy, simple comparison and mostly kind of get away with stuff. Um, and of course, these scope comparisons happen all over the protocol. Like I was just saying, you know, uh, if a client is registered to only be able to ask for certain scopes or a resource owner can only approve certain scopes, or you've got an assertion or refresh token coming in and somebody's asking for a different set of scopes, you have to figure out does what they're asking for align with what they're allowed to do uh, for any one of those, one or more of those various reasons that I was just talking about. And 
probably a bunch of other corner cases too that I'm not really getting into right now. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got to figure out how to do this with these big rich authorization Justin, details objects. Yeah. Justin, do you mind if I ask a question on the previous slide? Um, yeah, go ahead. Previous slide. Please. Are you? Are you um, uh, Hannes, on the I first... would. I, I would ask if uh, that you could use the queue though, so, uh, just so that we don't do that. I, you're fine now, but just in the future. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, That's okay. Go ahead, please. Um, so in the in with the first uh, statement, like um, it may be intuitive to say if someone requests a scope of ABC that this actually is more than A plus B, but um, that by itself hasn't really, uh, that assumption hasn't really been made in the scopes, at least in OAS. Are you sort of like assuming that in the in the spec and spelling it out or? No, that's actually spelled out in 6749. Um, I'm just trying to find the exact. Mm, okay. Maybe. Yeah, I think it's in section 3, 3, um, okay. maybe I need to, yeah. Uh, so section 3, 3, uh, if the value contains multiple space delimited strings, their order does not matter. And each string adds in an additional access range to the requested scope. Okay. That's that is technically the definition of scopes, but that's kind, not really, uh, how people use them in practice, because, for example, if I have repo and repo status, adding repo status doesn't add an additional range. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I'm more worried that, uh, some, uh, something, of course, that they are not, uh, this joint necessarily this joint permissions, but, uh, I was more worried that something would take permissions away. Uh, so it's, it may be less intuitive than. Or deployments may be less intuitive than one would uh, think. Right. I mean, you could, you can imagine a negative access scope. I personally couldn't find an example of one for, uh, uh, to bring up on the skull, but, but I, I guarantee you that somebody's done that. Somebody has a scope that says actually do less than if I hadn't sent it to you. Yeah. Just cause it's possible. Like it, because it's technologically possible. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Great, great point though. But yeah, it is, it is section 3.3 .3 in, um, in the OAuth 2 spec. Yeah. Text. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. That's okay. Everybody forgets that part because that's not how we use it. Um, but that brings us to how, how do we compare authorization details? Because, you know, scope strings, like I said, you can kind of get away with being fast and loose, parse it into a set, do some basic set math and. It, it mostly kind of works. It, it fails in the right direction most of the time. Um, so with these authorization details, we've got a few options of how we could approach this in the actual um, extension spec text in RAR. Uh, we could just not say anything and hope for the best, which is kind of what we have right now. Um, the editors don't believe that that's the best, uh, the best approach here, um, just to say. Um, we could have language about how to compare JSON objects uh, that are in the array coming in, uh, comparing values across different fields. Um, we could explicitly define that it is fully out of scope, but the editors have uh, talked about this recently uh, based on the conversations that have happened on the list. And we actually think that the best approach is to kind of combine two and three here, is to say that the, the details of this are defined by the type value, just like all of the rest of the processing of the authorization details is defined by that type value. It's sort of namespaced into there. Uh, and the comparison is similarly uh, bound to that, but also uh, give examples of what common kinds of things um, you, you might see so that we're not leaving developers to completely start with a blank page in uh, how they're approaching things. Because the truth is we're probably going to see a bunch of common uh, patterns and that's what I'm gonna go through next. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you're looking at two different authorization requests, um, on the right-hand side, you see that we have added more things into the object, into the actions, locations, and data types field. We just added additional values. And so it's a really simple logic to say that if everything is defined, you know, uh, orthogonal and separate from each other, if your API is very, very cleanly designed like this, then if you have more stuff in the object, you're asking for more things. If you have different stuff in the object, you're asking for different things. 
Now, for the reasons we talked about before, we can't assume that this is a universal thing, but this uh, we think is probably going to be a common enough pattern to at least call it out as an example for people who are designing their APIs and looking to use RAR so that they could figure out how to uh, how to actually do this very important comparison function. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another thing that we know exists out there is this notion of subsuming values. So say, for example, when I get the right access, I automatically get read access just because of the way my API has been designed or more specifically the way the rights to my API have been designed. And uh, so my AS when comparing these things would need to know that. You know, if I already have right access and I ask for read, then I'm not actually asking for more. I don't need to go reprompt the user and say, just read access because the users already said, yes, this is fine. And that can go across all of these different dimensions, all of these different fields. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a lot of APIs, I think are, uh, we're going to see them deployed with sort of a reasonable set of defaults. Uh, so if I don't specify something in say, data types when I'm talking to the photo API, it's going to assume, oh, you probably mean images. We already see default scopes in a lot of uh, OAuth deployments today. When you don't ask for any scopes, the server is allowed to say, oh, here's the box of scopes that you get just in that case. And uh, we think that we're going to see that same type of pattern across different RAR types as well. Um, and Torsten's actually got a whole um, section in the latest, uh, it's at least in the editor's copy. I don't remember if it's in the published draft yet about uh, filling in this kind of uh, protocol detail. So um, when even though you ask for just read, maybe you uh, you actually get told, oh, it was read at this location with this type, with this identifier, with this you know specialty field, whatever, all of that gets uh, gets sent back to you at the end. But the AS still has to be able to compare these kinds of things um, because if you're going in and just asking for read, but you only have read at a non-default location, then is is that asking for more? Is that asking for less? And the AS needs to be able to figure figure out how to compare these things when they're not complete. Next slide, please. Um, we can also have similarly uh, something with an additional piece of detail added along. So uh, in this straw man example, I'm now asking for uh, not just any photo API, but a very specific either photo or collection of photos or something that that identifier points to. Whereas before I had access to everything at that server and now I'm asking for more stuff. There is more stuff in that object, but I'm being more specific. So it's actually a lesser set of access than previously uh, done. And um, for anything that allows this type of narrowing of access at runtime, uh, which a lot of advanced APIs, so you can think about like bank account identifiers or medical record identifiers or things like that, we're gonna see the same type of pattern. And um, okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, so Phil has a, a question, do you wanna? Yeah, I just saw that in the chat. I didn't know if you wanted me to grab Phil, Phil, do you want to ask yeah, that Phil, question? Do you want to jump on? Uh, it was just because you mentioned it in the slide a couple of times, and and I think semantics get complicated both in the protocol world mm -hmm. and in the user world when you actually have to display it. Although in my experience, we don't end up actually displaying the authorization request to the users. It's usually protocol negotiation between clients and servers anyways, and at least the cases I encountered um, or encounter. Um, but in the case of your example of the client requests repo and doesn't need, know that it, it has all the downgrade scopes like repo status, why would you not just return all the implicit scopes with, with the authorization results so the client knows what it actually has? So it's not a matter of the client necessarily knowing it. It's about the AS uh, being able to compute the fact that there are all of those implicit scopes uh, when things come in. We're not talking about what you send back to the client. Uh, we're talking about uh, when the client asks for something in any of these contexts, uh, it's going to have a set of things that are allowed or a set of things that are authorizable, and the authorization server needs to be able to compare that with what was requested. So yes, you could you could in fact return um that kind of thing if it made sense um 
But I mean, look at the example that's on the screen right now. Uh, would that mean that the server would have to send back a list of all possible identifiers and all possible uh, action combinations and locations and things like that back to the client? You could do that. I can jump um, in here, Justin. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, this is this is Aaron Brecky. Um, I have a concrete example of why it would not be practical, and that is if the right. authorization server and resource server are not tightly coupled, where the AS right. is a product that doesn't know the inner workings of the RS and the scopes will be enforced at the RS level. So the authorization server might not even know that the scopes overlap. Right. And I was actually just about how does to it, how does it point that how does the AS know it can authorize that then? I, I'm, 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 I'm not disagreeing with allowed what... to authorize any scopes. It's just, you know, it's a it's a it's a product decision and a policy decision. So that just that is something that happens in practice, and in those in those cases, it's the resource servers that are up to the, the ones that are enforcing the particular API operations against particular lists and combinations of scopes. Right. This so is, this, my, is, this, my is, this is Thorsten, this is Thorsten speaking. I was just like uh, to to add that. I mean, uh, or what you just pointed out is in the end uh, part of the design, right? And uh, uh, drawing the boundary between AS and RS. The more the the more the, the more the AS knows, the more it can authorize. And uh, especially in the use case that we see with authorization details, um, the AS typically needs, needs to know more than we uh, thought in traditional OAuth use cases. But um, trying to answer Phil's question, um, I think what's just, what, what, just, what Justin tries to get at is, is, is something different. So clearly the AS can, can return everything that it can resolve. So the draft already states that um, if if the AS wants to enrich the authorization details object, it can do so at any time. So, for example, if the authorization request contains a default, as shown, I think in the previous slide or the the, the slide before, the AS could could um, easily add um, other details and play that back to the client. But the problem that that we are after here is that the AS first needs to determine. Uh, what's already existing, and what uh, uh, what is what the client asked for to to in, in the in the end to come up with the with the set of requ uh, of privileges that it needs uh, to access to, to to get consent from the user. So that that's that's the that's the kind of question we want to tackle here. Right. Thank you, Torsten. Yeah, and that's that's what I was trying to say at the beginning um, is that. Uh, it's it's interesting, and you could do that, but that's fundamentally not what we're trying to answer here. That's that's not germane to the problem that uh, this is trying to address and solve. Um, you know, because this, no matter what you tell back to the client, the AS still has to make a decision about whether or not uh, to grant some access. And I mean, ultimately, the RS also has to make a similar decision, but it tends to be a little bit simpler from the RS uh, perspective because. All it needs to know is, you know, enough about its own API, which you would expect it to be an expert on already, um, to know if the thing that's uh, coming in is uh, is able to be done. Uh, fundamentally, though, under the hood, all of these do require you to compare these kinds of objects. Um, ah, yes, and Torsten just posted a link for the enrichment. That I guess that is in the current uh, the current draft. Uh, next slide, please. Because this gets even more fun. But when you realize that this is that this is a set, you're uh, you're allowed to have multiple different things. Now, OAuth scopes are a set um, from a data structure perspective. They're encoded as a single string, but they are a set of different objects. And so I can ask for multiple things. And you know, maybe asking for write on images includes read on metadata, or maybe it doesn't. And I'm asking for two different kinds of things. And did I even need to ask for that additional scope? And when, you know, and to Phil's question, if what I get uh, back, you know, is that going to include the entire cross product of everything that I might be able to use that access token for? Maybe, maybe I'll only get the uh, subsumptive values. That's uh, that's going to be sort of up to the uh, up to the higher level. Um, and next slide, the uh, this gets really really out there when you start to realize that um, we don't have control over API designers. And that's fundamentally the question here, because who are we as um, security protocol designers to say that, you know, your BAS value of true is equal to 
or greater or less than or whatever the quarks value of quarks. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm realizing that I've wrote these slides without realizing I'd have to say them out loud. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, the point here is that APIs have lots of different kinds of designs, lots of different, uh, ortho uh, orthogonal approaches to how access is determined and rich authorization requests need to be a carrier and enabler for all of those types of things and all of their various definitions of fine grain. So what do we do? Next slide, please. Uh, we've seen a bunch of things and honestly, all of them are correct. Uh, those are all reasonable ways to compare objects. So OAuth doesn't really take a stance on the nature of the API that's protecting and that has hugely been to OAuth's benefit. Um, other protocols, other security protocols have taken very, very strong stances and saying like, oh, this is only going to be good for REST style APIs where, you know, you have an identifier in the URI. And that's the only thing that this is going to work for. OAuth doesn't care, as we see with the OpenID Connect user info endpoint. It's the same URI for all resources and it depends on the access token coming through, right? Um, so RAR needs to be able to keep living in that world. And, um, and in order to do that, what we're proposing next slide is to provide guidance to tell people that when you're building an authorization server and to somewhat of a lesser extent, the uh, resource server, you need to be able to do this comparison. You need to be able to say in these different contexts, what more or less is and things like that. And that's part of your definition of what your type value types of objects are. Now, we've already got some language in there uh, about when you're defining a new rich authorization type, what that uh, looks like and sort of, you know, what needs to come into this. And uh, we've taken in some language from the GNAP specification um, into RAR and, you know, vice versa, as Torsten mentioned, we're trying to keep these in sync uh, as, as much as it makes sense to. Um, that when you're defining this type, then you right now you already need to consider like you know how all of your bits uh connect together so if i asked for you know two actions in one location versus one action in two locations what does that actually mean to my api is that allowed you know i have to be able to specify that kind of thing uh so what we're proposing is that we also specify that you have to say how you compare things both within your type and even have um some suggestions about how an AS might compare things across types so that we get somewhat reasonably predictable behavior, even though fundamentally it's all going to be down to the kind of definitions that the types themselves make. So the spec can show common patterns as examples, as non-normative examples, uh, and the requirements will be around, okay, this is how you need to make this comparison. How you actually calculate that comparison is up to you. We'll, we'll kind of point you in some common directions, but you've got to decide that and you need to be able to understand what that means. Uh, this more or less or even just different type of thing needs to be able to be defined when you're defining this type and when you're using RAR. Uh, that I think is our last slide. Um, so that's, that's where the editors have landed right now. We don't have proposed text for this yet um but this is the direction we were looking to go okay thank you um phil do you wanna talk about the latest comments that you put there um sure i'm not saying this is bad i'm just sort of making some broad observations because i think i'm coming to this a little greener than others and i think in the old as rs model and, and this came out earlier the as was much more bound up into to enforcing who could have what roles let's just call them roles for now as a comparison um and the as knew that and then, and then when you got to the rs all the rs had to do was to match a role with the actual access control decision of whether a client could do something in the api um, but it was stateless with regards to who the client was. It simply knew this client has role X, therefore he can do whatever X says he can do. It doesn't really matter whether it's Justin or not. Um, in this level, this model, it does bring up, I, I agree, it brings up the case of 
who's actually enforcing security um, because you have this fine gra grain level enforcement OAuth 2 pulled out a lot of what the resource was from the from the subject that was it but it the, the enforcement model changes because because the RS has to figure this all out um, and do a lot more work um that makes sense. Uh, can I respond to Phil before we go yeah, back to the yeah, yeah, go yes. ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to say I uh, I wholeheartedly disagree that it changes the model. Uh, RAR fundamentally um, allows for the same width of uh, deployment and enforcement type of things that Scope does. You could do all of this calculation on the AS, and then the RS simply has to say if this string is in this JSON object at this. Uh, time, then the answer is yes, and I give you data. Uh, you know, the, it does not necessarily mean the RS has to be any smarter than any RS is today. But it also doesn't necessarily mean the AS has to uh, know more about the APIs it's protecting, given what Aaron was saying um, earlier about the um, about the kind of uh, you know naive umbrella AS uh, deployment pattern, uh -huh. which we know also exists. Uh -huh. And that exists today with scopes. Like that's not new for RAR. That's none of this is new. Um, I, I I would simply then add. I mean, yes, all things are possible. But because of that, what I'm seeing here is that you're now getting to a case where the API assumes the AS is doing something, which in many cases the AS won't, because it doesn't have the full context. Because what it's authorizing. It's not authorizing it's 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 not authorizing at all anymore. It's it's consenting. It's gathered a consent for a contract embodied by the RAR request. But it doesn't necessarily it probably more often than not doesn't know what it actually means. And if the RS is assuming that the AS made it a fully aware decision, we're gonna end up with decoupled decision making, which which is good in some cases, but in other cases could lead to finger pointing that just said, well, you authorized it, so I'm doing it. But no, no, you were supposed to actually read the contract before you, you know, that's, that's, that's all I'm trying to raise. It, it, as long as we express that, that those roles and what each party should be doing clearly um, and what the ramifications are, it's fine. Um, okay, Phil, so I would suggest that, that that is actually better text for, say, OAuth 2.1 or security considerations, because all of that exists today with scopes. Uh, those are deployment patterns and uh, sort of externalization of authority decisions that RAR doesn't change. What RAR makes more difficult is the fact that we have these multidimensional objects that are harder to compare than strings. That's really at the core of, of this discussion. It does not change the underlying trust model at all. Yeah, I fully, I fully, I fully, I fully, I fully agree because in the in the end, the AS always acted as a as a as a gatekeeper on behalf of the RS. That's that's built into the OAuth two dot two dot O fundamental principle. So we don't change that. What we do is, and we didn't invent invent that, right? So. Um, the fine grained authorization uh, uh, that we that we try to to standardize here is something that's happening. It's happening all over the world since I would say 2017 with the rise of, rise of um, um, open data because open data just needs more more detailed consent because of the obligations uh, um, uh, due to the the, uh, the the obligations from regulation and so on. So and it's it's been implemented in different ways and what we're doing here is. We give it a, a simple and standardized syntax. I I agree. This is positive in the sense that when what you're expressing is more actually ends up being more specific because you have the language to express something more specific, then then the decision is clear. Mm -hmm. um, if 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 you are using a complex mm -hmm. expression structure to to express complex features, that's that's the danger of it. That's all I'm saying. It's, there's two extremes to this. And when it's a fine-grained expression, then 
it's easy, easy for the user to understand what was consented and it's easier for the API to enforce it. Um, Except when it becomes a complex expression that we were going into the weeds with, with implicit and explicit scopes and those kinds of things, I get worried because it's not easy for anybody to understand what something means. I like the example when you're saying, okay, you have access, you're authorized, uh, right access to update this image. And when we get into the weeds about, does that imply read or not? That, that was kind of driving me nuts because I don't think that's what you're trying to do. I think you're trying to, be, that's trying to be cool with the language. I think though, the objective is specific authorizations, not more powerful role-based authorizations and stuff like that. Okay, um, we have two more people on, on the queue here, so uh, let's give them a chance here. Uh, George? Sure, and I, I think, I mean, it's all, I think, the same topic. I agree, Justin and Torsten, that we're not adding something new, but with scopes being space-delimited strings, right, I can do that set math as an AS and be pretty oblivious as to what it really means potentially at the RS. Um, and I can do things like downscoping tokens. I'm not sure you can do downscoping tokens for an AS that is acting as sort of uh, an AS as a service and the RS is defining the types Right? I'm not sure downscoping is possible in those contexts. And, and that may be okay, um, but I, I think that it makes it much more difficult to use RAR at the token endpoint directly because the comparison mechanism logic is not under the purview of the AS, right? You, the AS almost needs to go to the RS and says, hey, I've got a token with this in it, right? A refresh token with this RAR in it, and they're asking for this other RAR, is it okay, right? If the RS is really the authority element of, of those types, and we're just using, I think as Phil was saying, the, the AS as the consent mechanism. So a, a RAR coming to the authorization endpoint that gets presented to the user, and the user says yes, right? We're pushing that authorization decision all the way to the user, hoping the user can make a good one, right? And let it flow through. When the AS has to make an, a behind the scenes silent authorization decision between two RARs from a comparison perspective, I think that's going to be very, very difficult um, in some circumstances. It's, if it's very tightly coupled, definitely doable, not a problem. But if it's loosely coupled, I'm not sure it's gonna be feasible. Yeah, if I can just uh, respond to George. Um, yeah, I totally agree that it is much easier in some circumstances than in others. And that's that's a large part of what we uh, were looking to do with providing this guidance to say that, you know, if you're going to make this calculation, you need to know what more and less are. And, uh, you know, implied but not stated in that is if you can't do a comparison, then you're going to have to have some, you know, error path to go down. Maybe you, your error path is you just deny everything um, that, that comes in as looking different, or you always get consent if the object is different at all in any way. Um, and AS could decide to do that, and that would be sort of the safe, dumb set math approach. Uh, we don't want to, and I don't think we can specify that safe, dumb set math as what every AS will do in all circumstances. Uh, because I don't think that that's actually correct, and I don't think that that matches what APIs are using today and will use in the future um, for these uh, authorization objects. Um, but that's that does need to be part of this discussion, though. Um, that you know, if you're going to do this comparison, uh, or if you're going to do this type of decision, you need to be able to make that comparison, and here's kind of what that comparison looks like. And like I said before, I'll, I'll even say that all of that comes into play even at just the authorization screen. You know, what I show the user, what I, uh, you know, whether or not I just immediately return an error because a client asked for more than it's allowed to. You know, all of that comes into play before the user even gets uh, 
gets prompted anything on a page. Um, so I need to be able to do these comparisons at the AS at all levels uh, in order to to have this actually work. Okay, um, Jeff. Yeah, so this this might be out of scope because it's getting a little bit into the API weeds uh, the, for the RS side, but um, it, this feels like the like the from the client's perspective, it seems like it'd be very difficult for a client to be able to build an authorization or like one of these these return authorization requests without having some knowledge of the resources that they're needing to, to to request so would this require that like the user go through the, the the client go through one flow in order to get access to say query the list of available objects and then and then be able to generate these requests uh in order to actually functionally make use of this um uh you know, uh, as a, as a client, and is that how is that different or better than the sort of pattern that's already taken hold in say the uh, um, the uh, home the smart home space uh, where the authorization server uh, has the 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 customer the the user choose the uh, the resources they're granting access to prior to uh, redirecting back to the uh, the client um, with an authorization code. Yeah. So, in in my view, from a developer's perspective. Um, Clients are written to call specific APIs and do specific things. So this is largely going to be something that is going to be um, it's uh, for most clients. It's going to be coded into the client itself and not dynamically negotiated for uh, situations where you do need that dynamic negotiation, where you have a client that can call different APIs that are going to have different uh, objects or even fill in different values on different objects, yeah, you're going to need some more smarts, but RAR doesn't provide those smarts so much as provide you a structure for describing where those smarts go. Um, it, at the end of the day, it's, you know, look at what OAuth developers do right now. Um, they're t you tell a developer, put this string in this query parameter and it'll work. Right, that string happens to be a set of space separated scope values, but from the developer's perspective, they're just trying to call the API. It's I put this string in this value and things work. I think we're going to see the same type of thing here from the perspective of client developers most of the time. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, though. I just Aaron? I think both Aaron? models are totally valid. Yeah, I just want to say yeah. both models are totally valid, and I expect that we would see both in practice, but. There are definitely cases where that information will start with the client. So that's what this spec is trying to address of the client, assuming the client does already know what it's trying to request, whether that's a particular dollar amount, for example, like I'm trying to transfer only under $100 or make a payment under $100 or whatever it is. That's, you know, if you start with that assumption, that's what the spec is addressing. And I think separate from that, yeah, there are cases where. The AS might uh, provide a list of things to authorize that the client doesn't know about. Right. Hannes, who, who's this question for? Uh, I was just in general um, sort of responding to Justin. I was wondering whether um, this, dy this dynamic interaction model would at all be desirable uh, to standardize, like from your uh, experience. So you mean the RS discovery type of model? Um, yeah, kind of. It would be. I think it would have to be more than that. But uh, okay. like, because you distinguish between those two models in some sense. Yeah, I mean, I can only really speak to my own personal experience. But what I've seen, the vast majority of clients, and I do not mean client libraries. I mean actual running client instances out there. They're written to call an API. OAuth is the layer that gets in the way of them calling the API and the dance that they have to do in order to use that API. Um, and so if a client has to call a specific API, it's going to plug in whatever values into its OAuth library to make that work. Um, so making that more dynamic makes sense in the context of more widely deployed APIs. And we're seeing that in cases like you know, the open banking, so you've got the financial vertical with fire and the healthcare vertical, but those all have kind of their own resource discovery layers uh, that they output things that you plug into the, um, that you plug into the authorization layer, into the OAuth layer. Um, 
we have uh, we have similar considerations in the Gnat protocol about um, you know the RS and the AS and how they can possibly connect to each other, but it follows the same model. At the end of the day, the client is just going to request something at the AS, and the AS still has to figure out what that means. I would, I would like to add my my experience. So the question, an excellent question, Hannes. Um, going back to uh, to to what. Um, Chris, I think no, just let me, Jeff asked uh, with raw, you can, you can have both models. So, um, as Aaron pointed out, there are use cases where the client just um, assembles an authorization request object, sends it to the AS, gets the access token and is done. Payment is 1 of those. And account information is a bit more complex because you typically start with, give me a list of your accounts and then. Okay, I would like to add, um, access the transactions on, on this particular account, but potentially because the user selected that account in the identifying phase of the client. And then you use that value and uh, compose a new authorization request object. And, and that's perfectly possible uh, with, with what we have in the spec right now, and it's also being done. Um, I, I think what would be very interesting from an interoperable peer perspective would be to really have a model where AS and RS can really exchange ideas, uh, information, sorry. Because sometimes you really, and that I agree with George, sometimes you are approaching a territory where the S and the RS needs to needs to um, to talk to each other in the course of the of the, of the user consent process. Um, I, I typically try to circumvent that because that's it's, it's introducing a lot of dependencies, latency, and so on. So what we have right now in our in our implementations uh, is we've got more or less a uh, some logic in the AS. Um, Really carefully modularized uh, that does something on behalf of the RS, but does not need to really call back uh, to the to the RS. But that that's that's a new kind of interaction model. Right now, I don't think we need a standardization for that. That's part of the implementation design decision space, but might be a topic of future work. Okay, we are almost uh, out of time here. Um, Vittorio, do you want to talk about that? Comment that you put there. Um, no, not really. I was just uh, um, agreeing with uh, what Justin was saying about uh, if the client normally knows what uh, it needs and that entails uh, tight coupling. Uh, but given that uh, you made the mistake of giving me the slot, I <laughs> wanted to make uh, a general comment, which is uh, um, authorization is a very deep rabbit hole, and many people already fell through that before. So I'm wondering uh, if there's uh, any value in looking in comparing the subset of a specific authorization uh, aspects that we are considering in RAR versus uh, prior art, like uh, um, is uh, alpha covering some of those things? Uh, is it possible that some of the APIs that will want to use RAR as a way of communicating requirements are already using some of these other uh, standards to uh, specify at rest? What their permissions and authorization logic is. So, like, I, I don't have a, any specific example. I just wanted to throw out there whether you guys considered that. Um, okay, maybe quick, quick uh, reply to this, and then we'll we'll finish it here. Yeah. Um, so we set out explicitly to not um, create or define a full query response or or. Um, or policy description, like executable policy description language with RAR. Uh, we're trying to skate um, as close as we can to sort of the simple, like, set of access rights structure that Scopes gives us, um, but allow for sort of another step of uh, specificity beyond that. Um, granted, somebody could use RAR to carry all of this other stuff. Um, and um, you know, they'd be allowed to, they're, they're JSON objects. They can define their own types if, if they choose. Um, but, uh, we explicitly didn't want to get into that space and Hannes, I'm sorry. We don't have enough time for me to say why Zachamel failed. Yeah, it's we're done here. So, uh, okay. Uh, I think, um, you guys know, how, like how to proceed with this. I think, uh, I don't think anybody is saying. No, don't don't provide this guidance. I think it makes sense. It's just the the details that we need to flush out and 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 discuss later on. Okay. Any right. any last minute comments questions? Okay. 
Thank you all. See you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.